face on. <laughs> All right, you may be seated. Good to see you this morning. Hope that you feel welcome to the service. We're glad that you're here to worship with us today. We have baptism today, which is always exciting at Believer's Fellowship when we have baptism. And uh, so we're excited you're here to be a part of it. We believe at our church, and we believe the Bible teaches, that baptism is not essential for salvation, but is an essential testimony of our salvation. First commandment the Lord Jesus gives the church is after teaching and discipling the people that they're to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that baptism is a clear testimony of what Jesus did for us. He went to the cross, he died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. The testimony of this water is the testimony of anybody who also comes to Christ, that we are in Christ once we submit our hearts and lives to him. Our lives are personally committed to Jesus. He comes into us. And we, the Bible says that our life is hid with Christ in God as well. So we express that new life. The confession of our salvation is these waters where we come and we identify with Jesus in his death and burial and his resurrection. So we come today to give that testimony and to give that picture today. Amen. Excited especially today about getting to baptize my daughter-in-law, Stephanie. Hi guys. Um, <laughs> um, well, at the age of 11, I asked the Lord into my heart, and I never really thought past really professing uh, my faith through baptism. Never really thought about it as a child. And as the years went on, and I went through life and college, I just always let different circumstances get in the way. Um, always telling myself next year, next month, even next time, and always thinking I had all the time in the world. And you know, as we can see right now, especially in the times that we're living, that, you know, tomorrow isn't promised to anyone. Right. Um, so, as of right now, I am no longer making excuses, and I am getting baptized. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am honored to be the one who gets to baptize you, Stephanie. So, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, and my daughter, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Married with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good, girl. Then we have Corey Waldrop. He's thinking I might hold him under. I've been wanting to baptize him for so long. <laughs> Have a word, brother. Uh, this has been a long time coming. And I know there's a lot of people in the church, my family, friends, that have been praying for me. And I want to thank you. It's finally sunk in, and it, it's paid off. Amen. I've, uh, I didn't really grow up in a religious family. And throughout my childhood, there were a few times where I had the opportunity to give my life to Christ, but I never took it. And as I got older, and I struggled with it, I, I always felt like I would be a hypocrite because I knew that my life wasn't right. And I felt like if I made that decision, it wouldn't be a, a true faithful decision. And as I got older, I realized that I was just making excuses. and. I finally decided to get out of my own way and and let God take over and it completely changed my life. <laughs> I've I've never been as happy as I am now. And uh, those of you that haven't made this decision, I can tell you from experience, just get out of your own way and you know, open your heart up. That's all you have to do. Amen. He'll take over from there. Amen. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a brand new life. <laughs> amen and amen. Let's stand up. Or do we have a testimony first? Yeah, y'all can remain seated. Trevor, if you'll come up here. As most of you know,
You know, it's a great video just to remind ourselves the fact that uh, no matter what, if you're a child of God, if you belong to the king, you're never, ever at a time where you're alone. And in fact, I, the message today is dealing with discouragement, so I thought there'd be a nice little clip to show before I got up to preach, because uh, I believe we all deal with discouragement on different levels, different times, different ways through our life. And I trust that today's message will be a message of encouragement for you. We're living in a time when, especially for the believer, these can be very discouraging days. I mean, uh, things that are happening in our culture, within our own country, these are times of immense discouragement. Uh, let me just share a passage with you from 1 Corinthians this morning. That went the wrong way. I pushed the wrong button. Let's go back the other way. <laughs> it's upside down. He says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things because of shame, not walking in craftiness, or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I thought, what an appropriate scripture in the culture and in the time that we're living in. When so often Christians and churches even have a tendency to adapt to the culture. They have a tendency to say, we want to reach the culture, so let's, uh, let's be sensitive to those who might be seeking and seek not to offend on any level by standing on our convictions or raising a standard. But the Bible says in those times, it's just the opposite. God's given us mercy for times just like this. God's given us mercy for days that are just like this. And we've renounced the hidden things. We don't want any part of the hidden things. He says the things that are shameful. We're not walking in craftiness and we're not adulterating the word of God, which simply means I don't twist the Bible to make it say what I want it to say. I don't twist the scriptures to get it to mean what it doesn't mean, but yet how it just still lines up with what I want. These are not the days for that. And yes, we're, there are times that are discouraging. There's decisions that we're facing all the time that are discouraging. We say, hey, we have the mercy of God. Today's message, I just want to let you know right off the bat, is not for you specifically, although it is in some ways. It's really for me because it came at a time when I was just sensing a lot of discouragement over what's going on with our nation and with our culture. And these little words that the Lord spoke to my heart. The Amplified Bible puts it this way. <clears throat> Since we hold and engage in this ministry by the mercy of God, granting us favor, benefits, opportunity, and especially salvation, we do not get discouraged spiritless and despondent with fear or become faint with weariness and exhaustion. We're going to stand our ground. We'll stand and be what God's called us to be. So not only are those things discouraging, there's a lot of things in life that discourage. Someone asked me, Brother Joe, what is it that discourages you? Well, of course, right off the bat, I said the Supreme Court of the United States of America <laughs> and, and their decision processes. That's tremendously discouraging. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, summer church attendance. <laughs> always goes down in the summer and that's just discouraging. Uh, when we're not baptizing a lot of people regularly as a pastor, that's discouraging because I know what our vision is and our goal is in reaching people and bringing people to Christ and the knowledge of the Savior. Amen. I think one of the greatest discouragements for any pastor is when somebody leaves the church, when there's someone leaves the fellowship uh, for whatever reason, whether they're moving or backsliding or just deciding they don't want to go to church there because they're upset with somebody in the fellowship. You know, that's, that's extremely discouraging. It discourages uh, me. It discourages other people in the fellowship. It's a discouraging thing when people leave the church. You know, uh, my wife's health, when it doesn't improve, that's discouraging. That just knocks the wind right out of you. That's discouraging. Uh, let me put it simple, and I think we'll all get, get this one. I'm most discouraged when things don't go my way. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the bottom line of it all, isn't it? When I'm not getting what I want, when I don't get my way, when I have something in mind or some expectation or some hope or aspiration and it just doesn't come through or it doesn't happen. But I want to talk to you about today and, and look at this passage of scripture in a, in a different light. Obviously, he's talking about in the context of ministry, but Satan can discourage us in many, many, many ways. There's three areas really for me and probably for you as well. Satan is always attempting to discourage me. He attempts to discourage me in my home, you know, in my my wife, my relationship, or with my children. Satan's always wanting to interject something so that we're not effective as the family that God wants us to be. So he, he tends to, to really seek to discourage us in our, in our family life and in our family situation. He seeks to discourage us uh, in our ministries and whatever it might be. You have something you're doing, uh, 
you have an expectation or aspiration, as I've said, and things just don't happen the way you're really desiring for them to happen. So he attacks you in those areas. He, he attacks you in the area of your church. Obviously, he doesn't want you functioning in the body of Christ as, as the part of the body that God has called you to be. So he'll do things and he'll work in, in, in situations and in avenues so as to bring you some level of discouragement or, or disappointment in your life. He seeks to discourage me in my walk, my personal fellowship with Jesus Christ. You know, just the intimacy that God wants me to have with him. Satan's always seeking to do something there. So I've taken this passage today and I've pulled about seven things out of it. And I'm sure there's probably 70 more that we could look at. But, uh, you know, because me, I like to get long winded. We'll just cut it down to seven. All right. And keep it simple this morning. But I think there's seven things here in 2 Corinthians 4 that will help you in whatever regard, whether it's your walk, your marriage, your home, your family, your church relationship, your ministry. If there's been an element of discouragement that you've been kind of living under, I think there's some things that in this passage that will, will help you. And we'll look through these different verses in the chapter as we walk through it. So here's the first of the seven. Remember this, that God loves you. That passage says, therefore, we have received mercy. We have, he said, we, we engage in what God's called us to do. Remember it said in the Amplified, that because God has granted his favor, God has granted his benefits, God has granted his, his love and his grace and his salvation. We are where we are. We are who we are as the children of God. Simply put, by the love of God. You know, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. But, you know, Satan always is attempting to distract in that air, to dissuade you that God really doesn't love you or that God's holding something back on you. Many disappointments and many discouragements come from the fact that people have a certain expectation that's not necessary, necessarily biblical, but yet they think God ought to do this if he really loves them. And it's a misunderstood concept of what it means that God loves us. But don't ever get to the place that you really are walking in an attitude we think God has forgotten or that God doesn't care or that God doesn't love. We don't have to look very far in the word of God to see a lot of illustrations, whether it's Jonah, or whether it's Job, or whether it's Elijah, or whether it's Noah or David, whoever. But what happens, we get discouraged because many times we're not really perceiving the will of God for our lives. And our expectations are not in line with God's at times. They're, they're really our expectations. And because of that, we end up with some level of disappointment in our life or some level of discouragement. Well, we need to go back and take for a moment, say, well, I'm discouraged about whatever it might be. God's, God's got you where he's got you is what this is saying here. You have received what you have from the Lord. God has blessed you. He's graced you for this situation. Whatever it is you're in, you can handle, you can deal with, and you don't have to do it in frustration or doubt or discouragement because you have as a testimony the very love of, and the grace of God on your side. So whenever discouragement hits, remind yourself, no matter how Satan tries to make you feel that somehow you're a neglected child or a stepchild of God, you are not. You're, you are the beloved. You are loved in the, in, the, in the family of God. Second, and again, this goes back to some of the things we're facing culturally that can be discouraging in our ministry. Because many times, instead of standing bold, some Christians will compromise. Instead of being strong in their faith, they'll buckle down to popular opinion. They'll believe a line. They'll believe a lie that somehow convinces them that what God says and what the word says, well, things have changed and times are different. So therefore God must have changed, but he doesn't change. Rem remember, remember this, keep yourself with a clear conscience. Say, so what do you mean? It is so easy when we come discouraged or disheartened, you know, in, in some regard over some issue or even in the cultural times that, that you get disheartened to the point that you just, you just let go of your convictions. You let go of your standards or perhaps you start doing something that you didn't used to do because everybody else is doing it. And you, 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 you kind of let go of convictions. You let go of those standards that you once held. And you just kind of start in this, this, this mode of drifting along with the current of either carnal Christianity. All right. Smells good, looks good on the outside, but there's no depth in it. Or just, with, just in a worldly spirit. He said, you've got to keep a clear conscience. What does that mean? It simply means I don't hold things in my life that I know that God is displeased with. I confess those things. I repent of those things. I, I turn from those things. He says, we have renounced the hidden things of, uh, because of shame. We're not walking in craftiness. We're not adulterating God's word, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You may be having a very difficult situation, but the worst thing that you can do is defile your conscience by saying something like this. Well, 
I don't think she loves me, or I don't think he really loves me anymore, so I'm going to abandon my marriage relationship. I'm just going to bail out of this because it's not what my expectations were. It's not what I wanted. I'm not happy, and I know what the Bible says. And when people come to me like that and they start telling me things like that, I, I always go back to what the Scripture says. I say, well, here's what God's will is. And they'll say something like this. They, they hang a little drape over it, and it, here's the drape they hang over it. Well, I prayed about this. <laughs> I prayed about this. And I, you know, so I'm sure, you know, hey, I don't care if you, that doesn't check mark anything. Right. It's like there's a checklist. Well, I talked to the pastor about it. That, that's my favorite one. I leave my wife, but I talked to the pastor about it. So what? He didn't agree with you either. All right. <laughs> so don't, don't defile yourself. And it's easy to do when you're upset or when you're discouraged in, in your situation or in your, 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 your place and station in life. It might be on the job, it might even be in the church. Something didn't go your way, so we automatically run to the flesh and we make a bad decision. I can pretty much mark it down. The worst decisions I've made in my life were made when I was discouraged. <laughs> made when I was disappointed about something. Well, I didn't really take time to hear from God and keep my conscience clear. I just did something that wasn't the will of God or the word of God in line with God's walk for my life and I chose against him. And so it's important that you keep your conscience clear. Obviously, don't make any major decision in your life when you're discouraged, when you're defeated, when you're living in some kind of spiritual realm of depression because you will always choose your will over God's will. And that's a bad choice. The third thing for overcoming despair and, and, and discouragement is keep Jesus as your motivation. It says this, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as the Lord, ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shall shine out of darkness is the one who's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. What's he saying here? Keep Jesus as Lord. Keep Jesus in that proper perspective. Keep Jesus in the forefront. When those times come, always turn in those moments to Christ and let him examine your heart. Make sure that your motivation and all that you're doing is Jesus-centered. It's not about you, it's not about me. It's about what does Christ want? Where is he leading? What is he saying? What is he desiring? Because if you move away from that, and if he's not kept in the center of those processes, then you can easily miss God very quickly and end up where you do not want to be. Some people say, man, I'm, I'm just having struggles here. And it's, you know, hey, the message of the gospel, of the grace of God, when it's seen through my life, it's usually seen most clearly when I'm in difficulty, when I'm in a crisis in my life and I'm going through a crisis. That's not the time to pull your stakes in your tent and just move out of the will of God. That's the time to steadfastly determine, I'm following Jesus through this. I'm gonna keep him as my motivation in my life. I'm gonna keep Christ first at all that's going. My decisions are gonna focus on him. I'm gonna believe him and you know, I'm gonna trust him. I really do believe that that old saying that went something like uh, uh, disappointments or his appointments. You've heard that before. I, I really am a strong believer in that because many times my disappointment has really been an appointment with God. Unfortunately, I've not always kept the appointment. <laughs> I've been late getting there or missing it completely saying, hey, well, what I really need is what I want. You know, what will really make me happy is what I want. What I need to do is what I want to do and miss it completely. What's, what, what's the motivation there? Well, it's usually me. What I want, what I desire, what's going to make me happy. There's, there's always going to be situations that are not pleasing. There's always going to be people who don't understand you. There's always going to be people who don't get your vision. There's always going to be people who don't understand what you're about. But you keep Jesus Christ as your motivation. You get down, and even in the decision process, is this going to please me or is this about pleasing the Father? Listen to what he went on to say in this verse, in, in verses 7, 8, and 9, all, all three. He says, we have this treasure. This is Jesus in this earth and vessel. It's the surpassing greatness of the power of God that it may be for, of God and not from ourselves. We're afflicted. That's discouraging, by the way, right? But we're not crushed. We're perplexed. That's certainly discouraging. But we're not despairing. We're persecuted. That's discouraging. But we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we are not destroyed. Always caring about in the body, the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. What's he saying? You're going through all these things. You're perplexed, you're crushed, you're, you're, you're disappointed, you're afflicted, you're struck down. All these things are happening, why? That the excellency of, of the power of God will be manifest in your life, that it'll be seen in your life, that you'll fellowship, even in the midst of suffering, in the glory and the grace of God. 
There's really no demonstration of God's power in my life when everything's going easy, when everything's going right. So that's, why, that's why it's important that I stay the course, that I stay with what I know is the will of God. I stay in the marriage, I stay in the fellowship, I stay in the relationship, whatever it is that God has called you to, that ministry, what, you stick with it, you do what God's called you to do. Because Satan, you can be sure, does not want you to discover what you're about to discover just around the next horizon. Let me, let me, let me just clarify this one more, one more way. I'm a Christian, all right? I'm a Christian. That's, that's who I am. I mean, that's who I am. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not a guy who puts a label Christian on his life. And some people, that's the way, they kind of look at Christianity like this. Well, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Catholic. I'm, and they have a little title we just wear. I'm a Christian. It's kind of like, I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm a liberal. And, and this is not about a label when we say I'm a Christian. It's not even about what you do, Okay. What you say, well, I'm an engineer, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a welder, I, you know, whatever you are. That's, that's, what I, that's what you do, that's not what you are. Now, what you are ought to infuse what you do. It ought to affect and infect in a righteous way what you do. That what you do will be for the glory of God. But it's what you are that we're talking about here. And what you are is a believer. So if I'm a believer, I have to stay the course. I have to walk in the will of God. I have to stay in the light as he is in the light and experience the fellowship, even in the perplexing, the difficult, the, the hard time that I might be going through. Stay with it. Trust God. See what he's going to do. Now, the fourth thing of this is understand you do have limitations. All right. You're not Jesus. I've heard you say it before. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> but you have Jesus. But you also you're living in this earthen vessel. We who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus can be manifested in our mortal flesh. But understand, we are mortal flesh. We need God. You don't just need God today. You know, we sing this morning, I need thee. That, we need God. We don't need him today more than yesterday or yesterday more than today. We just need God all the time. We need God. You say, what do you need most? God. We need, I need Jesus. I, I need to trust him. I need to embrace him. I need to hold him because I cannot do what needs to be done on my own accord. I'm not going to win you over. You're not going to win me over. I'm not going to get my opinion somehow communicated to the masses, all the masses. They're not going to believe me. But what I do need, I do need the Lord. I need him. I need, I need him and I need his church and I need his word and I need his, his, the faithful friendship of believers. We need each other. We need God. We cannot we cannot do what God's called us to do on our own. It's just not going to work that way. We'll end up using people and abusing the ministry that God's given us. We, we, we have to realize this whole thing starts with God, it's going to end with God, and it's going to get there through God. It's when Paul said all things are of him and through him and to him. That's, that's the goal of everything here. And so I have to get back every once in a while and just step back and say, hey, I, in myself and in my flesh, it's not going to happen. I end up striving in my flesh, and that's when I become most discouraged and most defeated. The fifth thing, that whatever I am doing, always remember to do it with the love that flows from the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, all things are for your sakes. Catch that, all things? Well, what about this bad day? It's still for your sake. Remember Romans 8, we said all things work together? It's for your sake. That the grace which is spreading to more and more people may, give, may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. He said, listen, God's working on your behalf, but it's not just about you. It's about the grace of God abounding to more and more people. God's still in the business of loving lost sinners. All right? God's still in the business of reaching people in pain, people in sin, people in darkness. Doesn't matter what the sin is. They're all sinners. We all need to be saved by the grace of God. It, it, we're not picking out one sin over another sin. In the light of the homosexual movement, that, that, that's what the media tries to make. Oh, the church is just against homosexuals. No, church is against sin. Church loves sinners. Jesus died for sinners. So we seek to reach sinners. But this is what your situation might really be all about in some way or another. Who in that element around you needs to be reached? Who needs to see the grace of God? Who needs to hear the message of the grace of God? Again, it gets back, it's not about me, so I need to operate with a clear conscience, a motivation that's driven by Jesus and a, a love for God and a love for people. There's one thing that you see, if you look to the cross, is you see this powerful, not just picture, it was a reality, all right? You see love in action. 
where he sacrifices himself for people who didn't deserve it. All right. There's nothing deserving about us. We'd rejected God. We'd disobeyed God. We'd gone everyone our own way. Right? Without excuse, the scripture says, all of sin, all have fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ comes in mercy and in love moves to become the sacrifice for our sin. You know, there's a lot of people witnessed to me and shared the gospel with me and passed out tracks, my own brother. That had some influence. But you know what the greatest influence was? Through their prayers and through those messages, my eyes got open to see the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I saw the bleeding, dying Savior on the cross for me. I should have been there. I'm the one who sinned, not him. He never sinned. He was blameless, spotless, the Lamb of God. It moved me. It convicted me. It broke me. I believe with all my heart when we operate in that kind of love, it has a supernatural effect on the world around us. There's something compelling. There's something drawing. There's something that moves in such a godly way. It's the Holy Spirit of God who moves and works in people's lives to say, hey, there's something real about that deal. They're genuine. It's not about them. They care about people and they care about others. Say so that the gospel may have grace is going to abound to more and more people. Jesus put it this way. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Have a kingdom kind of life. Live the kind of life that honors the father first. Let that be your driving, your motivation. for. And then he says, and then love others as you love yourself. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But that's what love is. I said with Tim, we're working on the conference for our marriage conference. Boy, I tell you, it's going to be, I think, probably going to be one of the best conferences we've ever put together material-wise that we're presenting for our marriage conference this year. But so one, of the, one of the topics that I want to see on the program is one simple topic called the power of love. I mean, we talk about the importance of forgiving one another as married people, right? And serving one another and, and, and doing all these things and the benefits of doing But if that's not driven by love, then we're just a clanging symbol. So let what we do, even in our marriage, as well as in our church, as well as with each other, be driven by love for God. Man, what God will do in that kind of atmosphere is supernatural. There's an incredible, incredible grace that flows from choosing to love. The sixth thing, find time to recharge. We don't lose heart because this outer man is perishing and decaying, but our inner man's being renewed day by day. You need to take time to renew day by day. If you don't have a time where you get alone with the Lord each day, you're going to struggle. You're going, you're going to have a hard time in your Christian walk. You're going to be in and out of the same old problem over and over again. There's just nothing in your life that will ever replace that time alone with God. Where you open up the word and you spend time with the Lord. The Bible says that Jesus did this. The scriptures tell us if we study scripture, all the great men of God, Daniel, Jerry, we see them stepping aside to spend time with God. Time to charge those batteries. Why? This mortal flesh is decaying. It doesn't hold a charge. Right? It's like a battery that goes dead daily. I used to have an iPhone like that. It drove me crazy. But I'm like that. I drive God crazy. All right. So I have to recharge. I need to plug in and you need to spend time with the Lord and let him restore what he desires to do in your life. You need to find time emotionally, mentally, spiritually. To, if you're going to be what God's called you to be, you've heard me say it a thousand times through the years, you're going to have to learn how to spend time with God and spend time in God's word. One of the great stories is throughout scripture, you see it over again, these, these men. Here's Noah, I mean Moses, he's leading people out of Egypt, millions of Jews behind him. They get all the way up to the Red Sea, you know the story, and looks in the rearview mirror, and here comes Pharaoh and his, old, his whole army, all right? And they're getting ready to take him down, it looks like. And all the people begin to complain. That's why I know they were Baptist, all right? <laughs> they begin to complain. Oh, Moses, would you drag us out here in the wilderness just to die? Is that what you want? You're so spiritual and you bring us out here like this. You don't care. And on and on it went. The Bible says that Moses got off with God and took time to hear what God wanted to do and then responded accordingly. David was running from the Lord. He finds himself in the land of the Philistines. He's so backslidden that he's so discouraged and he's so defeated that he decides, I'm going to join with the Philistine kings and go fight Saul. You know, I'll be king one way or the other. <laughs> I'm going to do what I'm going to do the way I'm going to do it. And so he gathers his men, renowned in, the, in war that they were, and he and his warriors go up to the kings of the Philistines and they meet with them. And one of the kings says, you're David. 
I know who you are. We can't take this guy into war with us. If we do, we're going to get out there. And as soon as he sees his brothers being killed, he's going to, he's going to turn on all of us. You know what's going to happen then. He's going to put a whoop on us. We're in trouble. We can't. Okay. And they deject him and they won't let him go to war with him. So as he's going back to his little camp, it's not in the promised land, not in the land of blessings, not in the will of God. He's living in a foreign place. He goes back to this little town called Ziklag and every Thing is gone or burnt or destroyed. The camp is destroyed. Smoke is ascending. His wife, his children, all his warriors' wives and children have been carried off into captivity. David's men. And these were the most loyal guys in the world. All right. These are guys who went through the most difficult times of day. At one point, these guys had gone through and snuck through enemy lines just to get him a glass of water from his favorite spring. That's how much they love David. But enough's enough. Bad decisions. We're out of here. And it says they spoke of stoning David. I mean, that's pretty discouraging for David, I'm sure. He feels like he's been rejected of the Lord. He's been rejected of his best friend, Saul. I mean, he loves Saul. I would say he loves Saul. He's been rejected by his enemies, the kings of Philistines. And now he goes back and he's lost everything. Anybody ever been here? Ziklag? I've camped there a few times. I don't know about you. Felt those kind of things going on. Just, you know. And it says, and David got alone with the Lord and got a word from God. And the Lord told him what to do. And he stood up and gave that word boldly. But what happens? We just get so discharged of the grace and the power and the anointing of God on our life because we're not walking in fellowship that we start doing things wrong and we start making bad decisions. It begins to skew our perception discouragement of our present situation. It skews our perception of our, our marriage, our children, your spouse, your church, and you, everything gets distorted. You don't, you don't see things properly when you're making decisions based on discouragement and frustration. So what do you do? You're going to make some bad decisions or you're going to get with God and you're going to find out what he wants you to do and you're going to begin to choose to walk according to what his will is. One of my favorite passages in all scriptures where it talks about Satan walks about like a roaring lion. That next verse says, but you cast all your cares upon Jesus because he cares for you. What a great promise from the word of God, isn't it? The last point, and we'll close with this, is keep looking through the eyes of faith. In 2 Corinthians verse 18, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal all right? But the things which are not seen, they're eternal. What's it? Let me say one. We don't look at those things that are seen. I know you've probably all said it. Well, it is what it is. You know, that's one of those statements, you know, there's a lot of those out running around. That's not my favorite one. It is what it is. Because it's usually said like that. It is what it is. It is what it is. Right? It just is what it is. No, it isn't. It didn't. Maybe it isn't what it is. You say, what do you mean? This is exactly what this verse is saying. This verse says it isn't what it is. You say it is, and it looks like it is, and it might be is in your reality, but your reality is wrong. The real reality is the word of God and what is true, what is God's perspective, and that is his perspective you choose to live on, bank on, die on, because that's the one that's going to go on forever. Truth is lost in the culture that we live in. It's kind of, I'm okay, you're okay. Whatever your truth is, is fine. I have my truth, you have your truth. No, there's only one truth. Everything else is a lie. And the truth is the truth of God's word. What does God say? He's given us this, this foundation stone. He said, if you build your house on this foundation, hey, you can, you can stand to this, up to discouragement, the storms, the trials, the distress of life. You, so you don't build your house on sand, which is, any is what it is, your perception of what it is. You build it on the word of God. This is what is. Why is it is? It is is because it is <laughs> eternal. Amen. All right? It's what's going to last. It's what's going to go on. So we have to discover, it's not what I'm looking at my physical eyes, although it may seem real. I want you to know that's temporal. What's that mean? It'll change tomorrow Amen. or soon. Be, you can count on it. Amen? I looked at myself in the mirror 25 years ago. I looked a lot better. <laughs> you know, I had a big old full head of hair. You know, now I look at the bottom of the shower and see that little hair going down the drain. It is what it is. <laughs> no, it isn't. 
I'm going to have a full head of hair in heaven. Amen. Amen. <laughs> what am I saying? Everything changes. It just, it, you know, your attitude will change tomorrow. Your wife's attitude will probably change tomorrow. Your children, every, every, we're living in a constant thing, series of change and change and change. It dies, it grows, it stops, it quits, it starts, it falls apart, it breaks. You bought a new car. I hate to tell you, three years from now, you're going to want another one. And that one's going to fall apart. It gets all temporal. The only thing that's real is that which lasts. If you can understand that, you're on the first path to making right decisions. The only thing that's real is that which is eternal. That's what you live your life on. That's what you base your life on. Because if you just look through these eyes at physical reality, you'll be disappointed. The eyes of faith look to spiritual realities. The eyes of the flesh might say, I, I have a lot of needs. The eyes of the, the faith will say, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. All right? The eyes of flesh say, boy, I, I just don't know if I'll ever make it through this. But through the eyes of the spirit says, God is with me no matter what. That neither height, nor depth, nor hell, nor demons, nothing is going to be able to separate me from the love of God. So the greatest thing about dealing with discouragement, yes, you get back to, to, to the Lord. You get back to walking with God, realizing his presence in your life, that he does love you. You get back to the place to keep your conscience clear. Get the junk out that you've let skew your heart and get into your mind and get into your life that are not right with God. Get that out. Get clean before the Lord. Get a clear conscience. Operate from a clear conscience. See what God does in your life. And then begin to be motivated by Jesus being the Lord of your life, not by your decisions and your desires. What does God really want from my life? If you can start making these kind of decisions, it just piles up one on the other till you get to this point where I am living by faith. That's the Christian life. The just shall live by faith. I'm making my decisions based now upon what does God want? What's God driving? What's God doing? What's God saying? That is when discouragement begins to disappear like morning clouds driven off by the heat of the sun. And the light comes on. And you begin to see where you're going and what God's doing. And I tell you, honestly, I really believe I live with a lot less disappointment in my life when I'm living my life that way. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Now, I'm not going to give a public altar call this morning, but I want us to stand with our heads bowed just for a moment and without any music or any, any 